Uh, the way it works here at the moment is, last week was Romans 4, so this week is Romans 5. There's a fellow called Alistair Begg, who's Scottish. And he tells this story that he was speaking um, on the west coast in America, and partway through, a, a person came up to him and slipped this bit of paper, a message to him. And Beg read it. It's a terrific message. The man says this. I have a friend who is struggling with a very serious brain cancer. His relationship with Jesus was such that a nurse wrote a critical note in the hospital notes saying, Mr. X is inappropriately happy. The, man, the note went on, since then it has become one of my chief goals to become inappropriately happy. <laughs> so presumably the, the nurse thought, that, you know, this person's got this cancer and this is the, it's not looking good and um, he should be grumpy. Uh, interesting that the person didn't say inappropriately happy. Happy, as you probably know, that people discuss what's in between happiness and joy. And happiness is derived from the same root as the word happenstance. And happiness does tend to be derived from things that happen to you uh, or don't happen to you. Whereas joy is a much deeper, richer thing of the soul. And um, it's a serious business, joy. I, I, I love that first hymn, Rejoice, that we just sang, Rejoice the Lord is King. Although I was struck when we sang it on Tuesday. It's a little bossy, isn't it, really, you know? It keeps telling you to come on, rejoice, and gives us a whole series of good reasons. But that's not unlike the Bible, is it? You know, the very famous passage from the end of Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Um, now, re rejoicing and joy is an emotion. Uh, a, a number of great Bible teachers I've learned from are, are around the world su suggest it's the only emotion that Christians are called on to have. Love is not fundamentally an emotion in the way the Bible speaks of it to each other. It's a way that you treat someone and value them. So we're going to look today at joy. Uh, as, as you heard the passage read, you might say, but Ian, isn't this about the peace of God? And yes, it is. Um, joy is the fruit that you get from the tree of peace. You can kind of tell the health of your experience of the peace of God by looking at the fruit of joy. Or to go back to the 1970s, if you want to picture it as a peace train, the peace train that this passage, is, and peace is the main theme of this passage, it's heading to a destination or terminus of joy. And if it doesn't get there, something dreadful has happened. Well, let's pray now for ourselves. Loving Father, we ask for your help today that your Holy Spirit would be so at work in this building, in each of our minds, and guiding me in what to say and not say, uh, that we would understand and appreciate and experience more of your peace and joy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, firstly, uh, the central theme or topic of this whole passage is the peace of God. It ties the passage together, verses 1 to 11. Verse 12 is very clearly a new section, which um, Andrew uh, Vella will speak to us from next week. But Adam and Christ, one of the really wonderful, distinctive, liberating parts of the scriptures. This is about peace. Uh, I have heard and read of some books that they'll talk about these verses 1 to 11 as the blessings of those who were justified. It's just a series of blessings. I think that's won't kill you to think that, but I think that's a, sh a little shallow in the understanding. It, it begins by saying, therefore, and that's one of the three big therefores in the book. Uh, therefores are the great keys with the apostles' letters that tell you we've, we've finished one section and because of that, we're moving to this. And if you get that, you'll get this. If you don't get that, you won't get this. And if you don't do this, you haven't got the that. Therefore, is that as confusing as I can make it? Therefore. So he says, therefore, chapters 1 to 4, since, and he summarizes them, since we have been justified through faith, that is, since we are now right with God, and God is okay with us, 
because of, trust, because of Christ and trusting in him. Therefore what? Therefore we have peace with God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, the second last verse in this section. For in, if while we were God's enemies, this is a striking thought, isn't it? Ever thought of that at the time when you were God's enemy? If when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him, reconciled is the process that you get to peace through, isn't it? Right? If you're fighting with someone, uh, if you're going to be at peace, you've got to be reconciled in some way. So it starts off talking about peace, verse 10. We were reconciled, past tense, to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved through his life. Verse 11, last verse in the section. Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received reconciliation. So it's really about peace and the difference that this makes in the life of those who trust in Jesus. Now, uh, the famous John Kennedy says rightly that the mere absence of war is not really peace, is it? So, but it kind of is, isn't it? It is, but it isn't. The mere absence of war is not peace. So between North and South Korea, there's never been a peace treaty signed between them. There's been a, they stopped fighting but they've still got many, many soldiers on the borders. Uh, so that's not really peace between North and South Korea. They're not able to bless each other and to do good to each other. Or between Israel and Gaza, it's great that they're not sort of shelling each other, etc. But you wouldn't say what they've got there is peace. You certainly wouldn't in the biblical sense. Because many of you know that um, the Bible's understanding of peace is, is very, it's a very central theme throughout the whole of the scriptures. Shalom. Uh, I didn't learn that Hebrew when I went to university or whatever else. I learned that word because I grew up in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. It was full of Jewish people. And that's one of the words that I picked up, shalom. And you'll know that the word shalom means peace, but not just the absence of war. It means things are good. It's peace in the sense of it's healing. It's restoration. It's welfare. Right? Things are good. It's a, it's a joyful thing. It's the picture in the Old Testament of, of every family sitting under their own vine and under their own fig tree. It's, you know, life is good and, and prosperous and abundant. That's what peace is. Uh, and what it says here is we have peace with God. Right? That the state, the relationship between the person who trusts Jesus, and you may have only done it five minutes ago, or you may have started it 50 years ago, the state of relationship between you and God is that of peace, particularly from his side, because of Jesus. So it's not a state of your feelings. There's, it's nothing wrong to speak about feeling at peace or to, the great sort of Australian movie equivalent of Hamlet uh, from the castle. Where it talks about, you know, feel the serenity. You know, you feel the, or the other one uh, from Seinfeld. And this is a... Uh, a particular show of Sean for worth watching, when the guy is trying to learn some peace, this one of the guy's father says, you know, and he has to scream out, Serenity now! So, you know, he's, he says it with such angst. Serenity now! He, he hasn't got any serenity, but he shouts it out. It's not that. It's not talking about peace as a thing in your heart here. It's something much more important, but it's something which generates peace in the heart when you get it. It's the fact that you and God Almighty... The one relationship that will shape your eternity, there there is peace if your faith is in Jesus. So you can speak about being justified, that is not being declared guilty but being declared innocent and okay with God. But by saying, reckon, using the picture of peace, it, it underlines the fact this is a relationship thing. It's not just a, a cold legal transaction. Being justified is like being reconciled. They're not quite the same. But reconciliation underscores the fact that it's a relationship that you're called into with God, and one where you were something and it's been changed. You've been reconciled. And it's picked up in verse 10 where he says this. This is shocking, and I hope you'll get the shock of this. Verse 10, If while we were God's enemies... Right? It's a very strong... 
The Bible will speak of there being an enmity in our hearts towards God. People are not passive or neutral to God. They may look to you to be bored with God. They're not. In the heart of human beings is either hostility to God or love to God. Right? There's no Switzerland when it comes to God. There's no neutral. Right? So he says here, the Apostle Paul says of the Roman Christians and of himself, we were once enemies of God. But we have been reconciled. It's a very serious thing to have been an enemy of God. Right? It's like being a sinner, but it's helping, helping us again seeing it in a deeply personal terms. But we've been brought to peace. How? By the blood of Jesus. And when the Bible speaks of the death of Jesus in these terms, as it often will, it's the blood of Jesus. I think what it's trying to remind you and I of is that this is a violent, painful death. It was bloody. It was gruesome. It was full of pain for us. And that's what has brought us to peace. That's what brings us to be able to have inappropriate joy. Because whatever else we're going through, and I know some of you in this room are going through all sorts of unspeakable pain, but at the heart and in the large question right, is that we've been brought to peace with God. Now, the cause of this we're going to see when we get to verse 11. The result of this, the fruit of this, is joy. And I thought we might watch in a second a, a video. This is just a, a news clip from when peace was declared in Australia at the end of World War II, it's got a very famous uh, guy in it, the dancing man, and I'm so pleased that I got a dollar coin yesterday and it's got him on it. I didn't even know until Friday that there were any dollar coins that not only have Her Majesty on the back, but have got the dancing man. He's quite a famous guy because it's, it's this video of the response in Sydney and there's one guy you'll notice in this who reminds me of many people at church, um, but in, enjoy the video. unforgettable day they didn't need to be encouraged did they? they just looked as if they were doing it apart from that one bloke who looks remarkably like my grandfather but he's dead so I can't ask him but um, he seemed to be a little out of touch with what was going on and there's a seven minute version if you like to you know, uh, look it up on YouTube and it's just wonderful seeing this ridiculous excitement because you know, if we can forget can't we some of you were there and you won't forget that, you know, that the Imperial Japanese Army was magnificent and it was in flipping New Guinea. And the first time they were ever beaten, the Japanese Army, was by the Australian soldiers on the Kokoda Trail. There's a little bit of national pride I didn't hear about till a few years ago. The first time they got beaten was in Kokoda Trail. It was very scary. More bombs dropped on Darwin than were dropped on um, Pearl Harbour. This is submarines. My mother remembers hearing the explosion from the submarines attacking Sydney Harbour. My father's best friend died in World War II. So when it stops, no one needs to tell them to cut up paper and throw it around. Right? There's, when you understand peace and the option, the other option, it is a time of enormous joy. And we have peace with God in the eternal lasting sphere at cost. And so it's a time for dance. We'll get back to that. Well, let's, have, let's travel briefly across the basic ingredients of peace with God according to God's word here. And you see it in verse 2, two of the great things. Two, verse 2. Verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, through, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace into which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Grace and glory. We have grace now. You know that expression you may have heard friends use or you may have been brought up to use it? You hear it sometimes in classics. They have fallen from grace. It can just mean someone's no longer you know, 
in a friendly relationship with someone. But it can be used technically to mean that you've sinned and therefore you've fallen from grace. I think that's a complete misunderstanding of grace, isn't it? As a Christian, a person who falls, you know, as a Christian, I've, I've fallen any number of times. I'm just thankful I keep getting up, but um, thanks to God. But you don't fall from grace as a Christian. You fall into grace. This is the ocean in which we live. So we have grace, that is the undeserved, unmerited, semi-ridiculous love of God. It's the love of enemies, which grace is. But secondly, he says, we have glory. Uh, We have the hope of glory. Hope here meaning it's in the future. It's not like the way you might spell, I hope it's going to be a fine day tomorrow or whatever else. Um, It's not that sort of optimism, hoping it'll be, no, 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 no. It's, it's fixed, it's certain. As we've shared before, the, the Greeks used to say, they used to call hope an uncertain goddess. And then in the book of Hebrews, as we saw last year, uh, it speaks of hope as an anchor for our soul. It's completely different. It's rock solid. It's our expectation that God will keep his promise. And that is the fundamental thing which we have to keep affirming, isn't it? That we believe God is a truth teller, not a liar. So when he promises something, you can bank on it. You'd be a fool if you didn't, if you banked against it. We have grace and we've got this hope of glory. We don't have it now, not yet. We're not in glory yet. As we mentioned on Tuesday, we've had you know, four of the finest people I've known die in the last year from our church, haven't we? Mary MacDonald, Bonnie Begg, Rupert and Ray. Where have they been for the last little while? Face to face with glory. Where are they now? Face to face with glory. What is that? What is that? talking? See, when we talk about heaven... Yes, it's true there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more tears, you know, there'll be no more tax, there'll be no more back pain. There'll be all sorts of things which are true. But that's not the substance of it. It's glory. Uh, glory in, in the Old Testament has a sense of weightiness. The glory of God is speaking of the substance of it. See, we're, we're, we're momentary critters, aren't we? We're like grass, here and gone. We're like chaff that blows off with the wind, the Bible says. But God is substantial. He's weighty. And the other sense of it is, is this, this sort of effulgence, this radiating, powerful, beautiful light. White light on its own can be quite startling. But the picture repeatedly given of God in the old and the, the glory is, is absolute beauty and colour. Right? Remember when you were a kid, maybe you, maybe you matured much earlier than I did, parents would drive around some view. Oh, look at the lovely valley. Oh, blimey. Can we stop and have a milkshake? Like, this is ridiculous. And go around another few degrees. Oh, look at that valley. Where we've seen this valley before. Come on, move on, move on. But they said, and sunsets. Oh, Ian, spare me. Every day there's a sunset. And then at some point, this is like cheese, at some point you just begin to appreciate it. And you think, wow, that is magnificent. Sunsets, sunrises. Right? They are beautiful. I think you do begin to appreciate them. I hope you do. And they're glorious is a word some people use. But that's nothing. It's like a bad radio broadcast compared to really seeing it. Right? The glory. This is what... See, you can't really enjoy yourself today, or most people can't, if they know tomorrow's going to be miserable. Right? Got a dental appointment the first thing in the morning, they're going to tear out some wisdom tooth... And you hear that there's been a shortage thanks to COVID of all the anaesthetic stuff. So it's going to be like dentistry in the 19th century. Have a strong brandy and bear it up. Right? So they rip the tooth out. You're probably not going to be too happy today thinking about it tomorrow. We do get anxious about tomorrow. Right? We have this superabundance, which is what you face. Yes, difficulties now. This is part of what peace is. It's grace and it's the knowledge of glory to come. And then it's also, as he says, and we'll just touch on this and come back to it in Romans 8, because he will deal with it more fully. It says this peculiar statement in verse 3, because we have peace with God, not only do we boast in the hope of the glory of God, but we also glory, and this is a very strong word which means rejoice, be happy in, 
We glory in what? Verse 3. In our suffering. Now, I talked to a couple after the uh, 9 o'clock service who are living with such pain in their family as you wouldn't imagine. If they made it into a movie, you wouldn't believe it. The pain that's going on in the lives of their children. It's just, I, when, when they first told me some of the story of it, I just, I just, I went home and spoke to Alice and I said, you wouldn't believe what these poor people have to deal with. Right? And I know in this building, some of you are living with unspeakable pain. Right? And yet this is, and, and don't, the Apostle Paul knows what pain is. He's not some glib idiot who's had a happy, warm, air-conditioned life, you know, lots of Panadol and even Endone and stuff like that every time he has pain. He knew much more about pain and damage. You read the list of his suffering in 2 Corinthians, whipped, right? often hungry. Been hungry often? Apart from when you're losing weight? Probably not. Right? Shipwrecked. That's not much fun. Ships are fun. Shipwrecked, not so much. Right? Beaten often, whipped often, stoned and left for dead. Right? And yet he says, not only so, we glory in our suffering. James says exactly the same thing in chapter 1. Peter says all the apostles lives in a world racked with much more pain than we're aware of. And yet all of them say, we can even find joy in our suffering. Why on earth? Well, he gives you the reason. Because it's productive. Any suffering we go through, God will use it productively. It's not a full explanation for suffering. I'm not pretending that. But it's saying God will use it. What it says here is, we'll come back to this again in chapter 8, we glory in our suffering. Why? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Produ perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. There is no such thing for the Christian as pointless suffering. I know it feels like it. What can the possible point in this be? But you do have the option in times of hardship to learn to build the muscle of trust in the trustworthy God, to learn to be humble, to put up with what seems ridiculous. As I've said to you before, I do think old age is the finishing school for the Christian life. It's full of humiliating pain and discomfort things we learn to do as children we lose the capacity to do all sorts of things and yet God will use it to produce character I'm not asking you to believe me but I am suggesting we take what God says seriously there These are, this is part of why we have peace in our experience we live in a sea of grace we're heading towards glory We've got this certainty of where we're going and even the difficulties of a broken world God will use for our good. Well, thirdly, the heart and soil and heart of, of, of this peace thing is in verses 5, 6, 7 and 8. Look at verse 5. Hope does not disappoint us or does not put us to shame. Lots of hope does, doesn't it? You had hoped these people would do what they promised, an organisation, a bank, <laughs> whatever else, some other organisation we trusted and it lets us down, right? Um, this hope won't. Hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit has been given to us. Right? We know that God will keep his promise for the future because we know that he loves us. How do we know that? Well, he says it's the work of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes into our life, he comes for a number to make us holy, but he comes also to convince you that God loves you. Uh, some people take it the love of God here in the objective, that is, the, it's our love for God. I think the whole context says it's not, it's his love for us that's talking about, the love, God's love for us. How? Well, verses 6, 7, and 8 will tell you how. How does the Holy Spirit convince you of love, of God's love? In a sense, the same way as this does, the bread and the wine. Uh, you don't understand anything about this, what the Holy Communion is about if you think it's something in itself. It points to something that God has done. It's exactly like what the Holy Spirit does. It points to where God has proven his great love for you. Right? Verse 6, 7 and 8. Verse 8, 
is one of my favourite verses. doesn't have to be your favourite. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. The word demonstrate is almost a scientific word. It's almost the picture of God is in a white scientific coat with a, well, it would have been a clipboard in the old days, but now it would be a sort of, a, you know, some sort of tablet, etc., on his hand. And God is proving something. He's, demonst- he's doing an experiment to show you something. What does God want to prove to you? He wants to prove that he loves you. How will he do that? Well, he'll do it by giving you good health and wealth, won't he? Now, all your investments will prosper, right? All your relationships will be... No, of course not, right? By the cross of Jesus. You know that, right? And if you basically think that God loves you because your life's gone well, you're in for a serious education because that is simply not the promise. The promise of the Bible is suffering now, glory then. The promise is that God has proven his love once and for all and we can't do any more than that by sending his one and only beloved child to die for you, not because you were good, but at the very point you were a sinner. As you know, it uses four words. In verse 6 it says, At the right time when we were powerless or weak, Christ died for the ungodly. So we're weak, we're ungodly, that is we're saying no to God. In verse 8 we're described as sinners. In verse 10 we're described as God's enemies. That's when God sent his son to die for us. Um, and my suggestion is most of us are in kindergarten when it comes to learning about God's love. I think the mark of someone who might not even yet be in kindergarten is that they, they think they know all about it. Uh, the love of God is one of those things that the more you know it, the more you think, wow, this is, this is amazing. I need to keep learning and, and meditating on this. That's why we do this so regularly. It points to his love for sinners. Nobody loves us like that. So peace is rooted in in the eternal, everlasting, covenanted love of God, the steadfast love of the Lord for us. Well, we get in the end now to verse 11, where we finally arrive at the destination of joy. Not only is this so, but we also... Well, your translation will have... it, It can go in about four different ways with this. There is about five or six words in the original Greek that get translated as joy cluster of words. It's a very important cluster. This is the strongest word for joy. It comes from the stiffening of the neck. Kalksamai, right? And it, it, it's, it, it's the thing that lifts up your head. Um, Old Testament professor, the, one of the smartest men I've ever sat under as a lecturer, used to say that the theme verse of the whole book of Psalms was that the Lord is my glory and the lifter of my head. Right? The one who... I watched the football match the other day with the Vikings versus Canberra Grammar. And you'll be glad to know the Vikings won. And um, at one point, the Vikings were behind their try line. The bad guys had scored a try. And they had a very loudmouth winger. They can be loudmouth because they're not doing much work, as you probably know. And he was, but he had a loud voice. And, the bloke, and he said, come on, boys, lift up your heads. You know, they're not good. And what this is saying is that, is that there's a joy that lifts up your head. You exult. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a triumphant joy. It's what you do when you've won a serious battle or a serious victory. We rejoice in, not forgiveness, not in mercy, not in grace, not in glory, but in God himself. We understand enough about God to glory in God we don't understand an awful lot of what goes on. We don't understand why we're so blessed sometimes. And we don't understand why life is so difficult sometimes. But we glory in God. And the call here is for us, on the, at the end of sort of understanding something about God's peace, is to be inappropriately joyful. To glory in your suffering, but more than that, to glory in God. And yet, I want to suggest to you, the problem we sometimes have is we are inappropriately unjoyful. And to be honest, it worries me sometimes about myself and it worries me sometimes about church. You know where you see it particularly is when we sing hymns. And I'm not looking at anyone in particular. The great A.W. Tozer says, Christians don't lie except when they come to church and sing hymns. What he's saying by that is we sing these extraordinary words as we're going to in a few moments. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the saviours. Died he for me? Are you kidding me? There's a sense of wonder and joy in so many of the hymns. 
We don't do it here. I've been to a cathedral once where we did it for a while. I nearly wanted to get up and shoot the guy leading the singing. Are you kidding? You'd be glad to know it wasn't the local cathedral. Steve Crane, the music minister at a church I had the pleasure of serving at, is still there doing a great job. Lovely, godly, wise Christian man, beautiful guitarist. Um, he used to say sometimes, didn't say it often, but every now and then we talk, it would be breaking his heart. You'd be singing these songs. And he, this is a, a student congregation, so they were pretty vibrant. He said, Look, he said, Look I, I feel like, am I the only person who believes this? The, it, it, I don't know whether or not. Our, so when we sing our hymns, it, we can be inappropriately unjoyful. I know, I, I get to see some of you sing, and it's quite wonderful watching some of you sing. Now, I know we're differently expressive, etc., and you can't. I'm not, please don't get me wrong, but I'm saying that there's a level of inappropriate, un, and you wonder, have we really got this? Do we really believe it? You're at peace with God. God has no quabble with you, squabble with you. When you stand before God, he'll welcome you in. You're a filthy, lying scumbag and you don't deserve it, neither do I. And if you don't think that, you're a proud, ignorant person and you need to learn more. Right? But that's who we are. And God is saying, I love you anyhow. As ridiculous as it was that Abraham at the age of 100 and Sarah at the age of 90 could have a kid. And that is serious, sick comedy, isn't it? They couldn't have a kid when they were in their 20s and 30s. They wait, childless, 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 decade after decade after decade, till he's 100 and she's 90 and they have a kid. And what is the kid called? Isaac. What does that mean? Laughter. It is a flipping joke. It's almost as funny as you being righteous before God. It's as likely that a 100-year-old will give, you know, 100-year-old husband with a 90-year-old wife will have a child as it is that someone like you or I but we have it. So joy is the way forward, isn't it? This is the most powerful word for joy that we have. The Westminster Confession, which Anglicans made, then we gave it to the Presbyterians. Right? What does it say? The first question it says in the, in the Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Man meaning humans back in the 1600s. To glorify and enjoy God forever. Glorify, we get that. Hallowed be your name. It's the first thing in the Lord's Prayer. Honour God's name, of course. Glorify and enjoy. Are you enjoying God? Or are you enduring salvation? God has loved you, sent his son to die for us. And we're just grim-facedly walking towards heaven and glory. I hope not. St. Augustine, the great North African thinker and writer, says this. The Christians should be one hallelujah from their head to their feet. Martin Luther says the Christian should be a walking doxology, a walking blessing to God. Now, these are guys who, who, who knew about suffering, knew about difficulty, but they knew about God. This passage is saying, peace with God, joy. Right? If, I, if I'm not living, if I'm a bitter, cynical, not that I'm looking at anyone here, but if I'm a, if I'm a cynical, dark, gnarly old, un, you know, un, I need, a seri- I need to go and see the equivalent of when I'm sending my car to see Michael, right? Fix things up. I need that often. You know, the other day we had a prayer meeting up the back. I don't know who organised this. It's a Canberra minister's prayer meeting thing. I think it's organised by some of the Caros. Although Bishop Mark was there and there was an archdeacon there as well. Archdeacon, sorry, archdeacon there as well. And so we were all there praying happily together. But there were a couple of guys who were leading the singing. It was wonderful. Um, from Carra Church at Fishwick. And I just, we were singing away, and then I, I looked, and one of the guys was on his knees playing the guitar singing. And I found myself thinking two things at once. I'm thinking, oh, you poser. Get up. Then I thought, you judgmental jerk, Ian. I have no reason to think he was doing anything other than what he felt he should do as he sang a song of worship to God. We often sing about getting on our knees and lifting our arms and dancing. I, I just think he was, I have no reason to judge him, but I did, right, momentarily. But just to know something of the wonder, allow ourselves to feel it. So as we sing, to, to really 
read the words we're singing and just think what a flippin' wonder they are. Right? How wonderful it is. So joy is the fruit. One last thing, friends. I have a, a friend who had this daily ritual based on Romans 5 that when he swung his, swung his legs over the end of the bed and put his feet on the ground, he would quote Romans 5 verse 1 to himself. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that, friends, it's taking that into our, and drinking it into our souls produces the wonderful fruit, the serious fruit of joy. Right? Um, let's pray. Father, you are so much more wonderful than we've begun to understand, so much more generous than we've begun to appreciate. And that day when we see your glory, as some of our friends do at this moment, help us, Lord God, to see that more and more and more, that we would be filled with joy and trust, reveling in all that you are to us, even as we live through difficult times, that we may honour you with joy even in our pain. We pray for this grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.